Here's part two of the snow day makeup, uh, and in this one we're going to be talking about salt balance and water balance. Um, to some extent we talked about salt and water balance when we talked about kidneys. Uh, in particular when we talked about the use of the hormones ADH and aldosterone and also ANH in order to control the salt and water balance. But salt and water balance isn't just about kidneys. There are other things that have to be considered too. So I'm going to talk about salt balance first. You have to consider both input and output when you're looking at salt balance, and you have to consider all of them. Urine is just one of the outputs that you can lose salt. Now it is the most important output, um, but some salt is also lost through sweat and feces, and so that all together is what constitutes the loss of salt in the body. You also have to include what you eat. So the food that you eat gives you salt throughout the day. Um, these numbers again are standard, they vary a lot from person to person and even within a person from day to day but a typical amount of total salts, all salts, sodium, chloride, potassium, uh, calcium, everything put together, it's about 10 and a half grams per day. Now to some extent, if you are salt deficient, you will have cravings, and those cravings will help you to adjust your input. The craving makes you seek out salt and eat more of it. Um, if you have a deficiency, you can also control the output somewhat. The kidneys, for example, can use aldosterone, as we discussed before, in order to try to reabsorb as much salt as possible and therefore cut down some of the salt output. Uh, if you have too much salt, that can stop you from eating salt, so it can reduce the ingestion. Uh, but it can also increase the release of salts through using things like uh, atrial natriuretic hormone, ANH, that we talked about last time. There's so not much you can do to control the amount of salt you lose in the sweat or the feces. It's a small amount anyway, and so you just your body just has to deal with whatever it needs to do for those. If we look at water balance, once again, total input must equal total output. There can be a lot of changes from one to another, but the output and the input have to be equal in order to maintain homeostasis. So if we just look at these inputs, the largest of these inputs is drinking, um, about one and a quarter liters per day as a typical value. But notice that almost as much is taken in in the form of wet food. Your food is mostly water. It may not look like water. If you eat a steak, for example, it doesn't look like water, but remember it's made of cells, and cells are mostly water, about 60% or so. And so all of the food that you eat is going to provide water even if it doesn't look watery to begin with. If you take all the water out of a steak, what you have is beef jerky, which is still food, and it's just as much food as it was before it was dried, but it takes up a lot less room. If you've ever actually made jerky for yourself, you may have been disappointed at how little you got from so much meat. Um, that's the case with uh, any food almost any foods. Once they're dried, there's not as much left. Um, when I talked about kidneys, I talked about the kangaroo rats and how efficient they are with their kidneys and how that makes it possible for them to get along with much less water than other animals. Um, they not only can go their entire life without ever drinking, but they can also go without any wet food. They can eat only food that is completely dry and live entirely off this third part 
uh, for us, fairly small, 350 milliliters a day of metabolic water. Now metabolic water is there because it's a result of metabolism. You'll remember this formula for metabolism, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy. This is the equation that I went over again and again last semester and kept calling it the very definition of life itself. And here we find it as an important source of water. This six molecules of water, for every six molecules, excuse me, for every one molecule of glucose that you break down, you get six molecules of water, and that's a significant water input for your body. Approximately 350 milliliters per day, for those of you who aren't thinking in terms of the metric system, that comes out to about 12 ounces, the size of a can of beer. Um, it's a, not a large amount of water, um, but it is a significant amount. And for those kangaroo rats, it's sufficient they can live exclusively off of this metabolic water without having to have any other water in addition. Of the water inputs, the one that is easiest to control is drinking. And drinking is generally controlled based on thirst. When you are dehydrated, the dryness in your mouth because of the lack of function of the salivary glands makes you wish that your mouth was wet and when you put water in your mouth to make it wet and then swallow it, it relieves that thirst. So water input is mostly controlled through the mechanism of thirst and through drinking. The amount of water in your food has more to do with what foods you're choosing to eat. And the metabolic water is based on how much your metabolic rate produces. So these things are less easy to control than the drinking. The total amount of input plus out of the input has to equal the total amount of the output. And if you look at the categories of output, you'll see that urine is the largest of those. Uh, that's to be expected. It might be interesting to see here that generally people urinate slightly more than they drink. And that might seem weird, but when you realize how much other water there is that we take in other than drinking, it does make sense that you might have more to lose. Urine is, of course, the main water output that you can control, and you control it mainly through that hormone ADH, antidiuretic hormone. But look at these other water outputs. We lose it an enormous amount of water from evaporation off of the lungs. Breathing causes you to lose water. If you breathe on a piece of glass and you start to see a fog, that water that makes up the fog was water that was just moments before inside your body as part of your body. Breathing causes you to lose it. And it's almost a liter per day of loss. It can be more than that under conditions where you're working really hard, working out, exercising. The more you exercise, the more you lose. People think of that as being sweat, but it turns out far more water is lost in evaporation off the lungs than in evaporation off the skin. You lose a little bit of water from feces. The Water content of fecal matter is important because it determines how, how hard the fecal matter is. One of the main causes of constipation is dehydration. When a person is dehydrated and their body tries to save all the water it can, it ends up reabsorbing too much of the water from the feces, and that leaves hard, dry little pellets that are hard to pass. Um, one of the best laxatives is just plain water, drinking enough water, the most important thing a person can do to try to improve their bowel routines. So water input and water output have to match 
anytime there's an increase in one, there has to be an increase in the other, and vice versa.